Hi friends, this is Jeff Kassman. Welcome to Tradition. Uh, I'm back once again with my friend, Jim DePiante. Jim, say hi. Hello everyone, hello Jeff. So folks, we wanna welcome you uh, once again to this series of interviews and discussions that we are having on topics that are of interest to uh, traditional Catholics. Uh, perhaps you're new to the traditional Latin mass and you have lots of questions and don't know where to go for the answers. Hopefully we'll help you out with those things. Or perhaps you've been around tradition a long time and you've always wondered about something and meant to ask someone and then forgot about it and then you stumble across that question again. You know how it is. Or, or perhaps you're uh, somewhat antagonistic towards the whole question of tradition and you think traditional Catholics are weird and they do strange things and they believe strange things. That perhaps. may or may not be true. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps you even believe that uh, traditional Catholics believe the wrong things or are doing the wrong things. Well, this is an opportunity to learn what traditional Catholics uh, believe and what they do. And then you can uh, take it up with us in the comments if you think that there's, there's something wrong. I, I know you won't hesitate to do that. Uh, in our first uh, few episodes, first a dozen or so episodes, we've covered a wide range of topics, uh, the various levels of the solemnity of mass, the gestures and postures at Mass, uh, the fasting and abstinence practices, liturgical years and uh, the parts of the liturgical year and, and the season of Paschal Tide that we've been in here recently. Uh, and then in uh, an episode just two weeks ago, we talked about the so-called Divine Mercy Devotion and Sister Faustina. That was a very uh, controversial episode. Uh, today, we may have uh, another controversial episode. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, well, last time we talked about canonizations and whether or not they were infallible. And today we're going to be picking up on that topic uh, and talking about uh, the, the so-called saint factory. Jim, are you ready to go? Ready to go. You buckled in and okay, uh, here we go. So some, some key points from last episode, just to kind of bring everyone up to, to speed. Well, we talked about how the purpose of canonization is to hold the canonized saint up for our veneration and emulation. This is not just about, about the fact that they're in heaven. After all, there are uh, lots of people who are in heaven who are saints who have not been canonized. Uh, when the church does this, it's about the fact that they had lived a life of heroic virtue. We talked about how the church has never formally defined that the canonization process is infallible. Uh, it is true that a majority of theologians hold it to be theologically certain. Uh, that's, that's true. So you would be, you'd be in the minority if you denied it. But it would not be heresy if you were to question a, a particular canonization. It might be ill-advised. Uh, uh, all of this with respect to the process that had existed for hundreds of years before the Second Vatican Council, before a lot of changes were made starting in 1969. In this episode, we're gonna be talking about those changes. Uh, we call it the, the post-conciliar time, that is the time after the Second Vatican Council, uh, and, and why some people have doubts about canonizations. So, Jim, why then do we question the process today? When, when you look at canonizations, recent canonizations, two things are spectacularly obvious. First is just the sheer number of recent canonizations. And second, the, the qualifications of those recently canonized. And Jim, in, in terms of the numbers, we kind of almost got into this last, last session and you wisely asked me to hold off. Give us some perspective in terms of, of the numbers of canonizations. What, what can you tell us? Okay, the process of canonization was more or less formalized by Pope Sixtus V in 1588. <clears throat> Excuse me, since then, roughly 300 years prior to John Paul II, 296 saints were canonized. That's less than one per year. Just as some recent examples in history, um, prior to John Paul, Pius XII canonized 34 saints in his 20 years. That's, uh, that's considerably less than one per year. John 23rd, 10 saints in five years. That's, that's two per year. Things began to change with Paul VI, 84 in 15 years. That's less than six per year. <clears throat> then things changed dramatically. 
<clears throat> excuse me, John Paul II, 482 in 26 years. That's 19 per year. Uh, Benedict, 45 in 12 years. That's four per year. That's, that's a lot closer, but still four times the historic norm. Francis is overachieving. 909 so far in nine years. That's over 100 per year. In less than three years, he canonized more saints than all of the uh, popes prior to John Paul II, who set his own records. It was Silvio Odi, Cardinal Odi, who called, who first called this uh, post Vatican II church the saint factory. That's extraordinary. Um, you know, we're living during a time of, of significant inflation. And, and uh, I, I'm thinking about the inflationary effect on the, the, the canonization process here, like, like anything else, uh, just it's human nature, the more of something that we have, the less we value it. Is that fair? It's, it's, it's fair. I mean, there's an old Latin axiom, asueta vilescun, which roughly translates as familiarity breeds contempt. But the problem isn't just in the numbers. I mean, that's astonishing enough in its own right. But there's also the question of the saintliness of so many of these recent supposed canonizations. It, it leaves us shaking our heads in disbelief. Consider that in some 1,000 years, seven popes were canonized, and now we have three. John 23rd, Paul the Sixth, John Paul the Second. Paul you know, the... Go ahead, Jeff. It, yeah, some of these, some of these canonizations... Well, you, you just mentioned some. Some of them are very high profile. It's not some random saint from the third world that, you know, somehow by a miracle, no pun intended, got, got canonized. But, I mean, th these popes that you named as an example, uh, in particular, Paul VI and, and John Paul II. They, they essentially they... presided over the destruction of the liturgy, the destruction of the canonization process, and... The, the complete destruction of the code of canon law. Yeah, by, by, every, by every observable, measurable standard. You know, in the business world, and you, I know you were at IBM and, and, and I'm in marketing, and, you know, we measure everything that matters, right? We, we don't want to <laughs> fool ourselves into thinking that we're doing, we're making great progress or we're doing good things. We want to measure it so we can look back and know and be certain. And by, by every measurable standard, the pontificates of, of Paul VI and JP II would have to be considered among the worst. In, in, in history, in, in, in terms of measuring the things that matter as Catholics, it's ironic. This is like the entire board of directors being given awards, being canonized while, while <laughs> business results are going in the toilet. Yeah, I mean, what, what do we think of as Catholics that, that matter? It would be baptisms and, and first communions and marriages and, and ordinations to the priesthood. and Principally vocations. Vocations have always been a bellwether for the health of the church. And we know that, especially under these two, two pontificates, that not only was there a dramatic drop-off in vocations, but, but a wholesale abandonment of, of people who had vocations so i mean just on those standards alone i mean even if we didn't talk about liturgical abuse we didn't talk about sexual abuse we didn't talk about eucharistic abuses i mean if, if we didn't even go there if we just looked at those things it, it i mean it, it just it, it looks horrible so just looks, as a look, prudential grim, yeah I mean, just as a prudential matter, a, a Catholic in the pew who does not have to have any special charism or license to teach or... or These are simple teach. observable facts, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's bad. Nothing in the history of the church compares to what, what we saw in these pontificates. And of course, we're not even talking yet about the time we live in right now, the, the current... <laughs> Where it's even worse. Right. Yeah, this, right. this, this, this strange thing, people, I've, I've heard people argue that, well, okay, maybe they weren't great popes, but maybe they were holy in their private lives, even if they were a bad pope, but, but we achieve our sanctity by being, by exercising heroic virtue in our duty of state, that their duty of state was 
Pope. And so if they did a poor job of being Pope, how could you say they were, they were heroically virtuous if the thing that they were to do well, their duty of state, they did such an abysmal job of? Yeah, and I think, I think that bears additional comment. You know, it's, it's of course conceivable that a man who's a husband and father, a, a guy like you or me or, or many of the other men that are listening, laymen, it's conceivable that you could become a saint even though you were a bad husband and father. But why in the world would the church hold you up and, and canonize you <laughs> as, a, as, as a person of heroic virtue that should be emulated if you were in fact a bad husband and father? Right. I mean, that, that's just, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so, this whole thing is, the more we dive into it, the more, the more troubling it is. I, while we while we do question some canonizations, I think it's it's worth pointing out something that that just because we say the process does not may not always yield a correct result, it, it's also we're not saying it's not the same thing as saying that the process always yields an incorrect result. Right. So we have the likes of Maximilian Kolbe and Padre Pio, among others, that no one would deny. Uh, so the heroic virtue on their part. So, so friends, when, when somebody comes to you and they've heard, out, heard you're going to the traditional Latin mass or something like that, and they say, oh, but you traditionalists, you, you deny all of, the, all of the new saints. Well, that's, that's clearly not true. I, I, I've never met anyone who denies that uh, Padre Pio or, or Maximilian Colby is a saint. Absolutely not. Uh, but in the past, nobody ever even presumed to question these canonizations. So something has obviously changed. Indeed. Pope Paul VI uh, made changes twice. First in 1967, modest changes, and uh, more serious changes in 1969. But John Paul completely revamped the process in 1983 and abrogated all previous legislation with respect to uh, the canonization, canonization of saints. So we're we're dealing with, <clears throat> frankly, a, a weakened process. And, and again, anybody who's been in, in science or, or business knows that a, a, a weakened process it, yields it, unreliable it, results. Yeah, I mean, if if the process if the process is is broken down you're not going to get the outcomes that you want. If the process has been intentionally weakened, you're not going to be surprised that you get, you get bad outcomes. So there's no doubt that the church has, has changed the process. There's no doubt that, well, I mean, she, she defined the process to begin with. She created the process. She's reformed it. So she's changed it. Does, does I mean, do we all agree? Does the church have the authority to change that process? Oh, absolutely. There's no question but only insofar as the process will achieve what it's intended to achieve. So you can't change it to the point where it's no longer effective in doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah, it would seem to be a, a defect of its purpose. Right. Um, so our, our first good reason to question recent canonizations is because the process has in fact been so weakened that it no longer does what it was intended to do. And that's right. Uh, the Pope's infallibility in all matters, is by way of divine assistance in carrying out his responsibilities as Pope. And that requires a certain diligence on his part in carrying out those responsibilities. I mean, this is particularly true for canonization. Yeah, in the last episode, we, we talked about uh, the, the verdict of the canonization process depends on human testimony, which obviously without divine assistance could only ever just be probable. And, and it cannot be morally certain. Right, which is why the process also depends on divine assistance. And so we talk about human testimony, but then there's also what's referred to as the divine testimony of miracles. Yeah, according, uh, I mean, the miracles are effectively, a, as you've just said, a divine confirmation supporting that human testimony. Right. And in the old process, this meant that at least two were required, two miracles required for beatification. And is it right? Two additional miracles for two additional canoniz miracles for canonization. That's correct. And and prior to, to Vatican II, uh, the Church followed the this procedure. It was very rigorous and was it was very exacting. Correct. Right. Right. So 
um, very roughly sketched out. Uh, the, the first thing that happened was a diocesan tribunal. This is where the person died, not necessarily where they lived, but where they died. That diocesan bishop, the local ordinary, convoked a tribunal acting in his own name. Then another was convoked exclusively uh, by the Holy See. And that examination for beatification, as you noted, required uh, validation of two um, non-controversial miracles. Canonization required examination of the brief of beatification, then examination of two new miracles, then three consecutive formal consistories of cardinals where all of this information was evaluated. And, and Paul VI and JP II changed all of that, right? They, they I mean, dramatic changes, in, in fact. They, they reduced the role of the Holy See. They, they split up the responsibilities among multiple dicasteries. They used to all be handled pretty much in one office. Uh, they eliminated the adversarial role, uh, the so-called devil's advocate. Uh, they reduced the checks and balances that had been kind of the bedrock of the system to make sure nobody slipped through that shouldn't have been there. And, and, and the consequence to this was a, the, the local ordinary had a lot more influence into the process, right? Right. John Paul, basically, this, this was essentially a legal process. So you had a person who argued in defense of the saint, and this was the, the promoter of the cause. So the, the, um, the, the defense attorney, and then you had the, the district attorney, the promoter of the faith, and these two went at it, hammer and tongs. This was a legal process, essentially a trial. And not surprisingly, a legal system was instituted and then grew up around the canonization process. John Paul basically abolished that entire system and then built a new process around what amounted to critical biographies as the primary method for determining sainthood. What little rigor remained <laughs> was often waived. As for example, in the case of Mother Teresa, the process calls minimal. I mean, um, originally the process called for 50 years before a person could even be considered ca for canonization. That was reduced to five years, but in the case of Mother Teresa, John Paul started the process himself. He waived it and it was introduced in, in three years. And then in fact, Benedict reduced the process for John Paul to something less than five years. So, yeah. Uh, so uh, again, if we're starting from the position of looking at the process and developing confidence in the process and understanding why prior generations of popes and doctors might have believed the process yielded an infallible result. We have to remind ourselves that that process no longer exists any longer. We have something right. radically different. Uh, speaking of that, what came of the role of the promotor fide or the so-called devil's advocate? Well, it was it was massively reduced. His purpose in the old system is <laughs> like he was the fact checker of his day. His job was to debunk to prevent rash decisions regarding first human testimony concerning the candidate's virtues, and then supposed divine testimony concerning miracles. Any difficulty or doubt, and it was their job to raise difficulties and doubts, any that were brought forward were documented, articulated, and each one had to be satisfactor satisfactorily answered before the process could continue. And this, the whole point of this, was to keep unworthy candidates from being given what is referred to as the honors of the altar. Uh, and, and we can say that this role was distinctively adversarial. You know, we, most Americans who are watching are familiar with our legal process, it's adversarial, right? There's a, a prosecutor and, and there's a defense attorney and in civil court, there's a, a similar setup. And, and the whole point is for the two of them to battle it out and for the judge or jury to then decide based on that battle whose, whose argument prevails. Who prevails, right. We, we, the, the, church, the church really, as, as far as I recall, was the originator of this process in civil courts. And, and, oh, absolutely. There's no question. But built on, <laughs> built on the Roman system. Um, but this role almost seems, this adversarial uh, process, the, the role of the of the devil's advocate is 
effectively been abolished, right? Essentially, yeah. I mean, apologists for the new process argue that it hasn't. However, the name was changed. The role was completely revised and reduced, and he no longer even takes an active role in the investigation, and he certainly does not take an adversarial position. So the formal process was focused on ensuring the integrity of the result. The new process is focused on just justifying whatever motives there are for naming new saints. Now, oh, it's, it's ironic um, in, in view of, of the, the saint factory and the rush job canonizations that we have, especially with, with John Paul II. It's not just trads who have an issue with this, even Catholics across the spectrum, even Jesuits, uh, are, oh, the, the, sec, the secular press as well say this was hasty this was hasty and of course this is owing to the discoveries of of his unseemly association with and, and some apparent role in cover-ups associated with sexual abuse this that lack of due diligence it's also coming back to haunt the the putative canonizations of paul the sixth and mother Teresa. how can we possibly consider these canonizations infallible when the investigations themselves lack the thoroughness that characterize the, the process before the council? It's, it's, it's worse than that. I mean, there's very compelling evidence in very many of these recent canonizations that evidence, there, there is evidence that information was critical of either the holiness or the miracles associated with the candidate rather than being brought forward as they ought to have been, was actually and deliberately suppressed. Yeah, it's, it's the kind of thing we Americans might expect from the confirmation process of a Supreme Court justice. Or <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so now we find ourselves with only one miracle being required from beatification and only one for canonization. Oh. And apparently the, the rigor uh, of the investigation of those miracles, really, it's, it's not there any longer. Now, I mean, traditionally, the kinds of miracles that that passed muster were <laughs> attaching some guy's arm <laughs> or, or restoring sight to somebody who had been blind since birth, um, emitting no possibility of natural or scientific explanation. I mean, the two supposed miracles attributed to the intercession of Paul VI, <laughs> I don't find it very convincing, and it's ironic. They each concern a woman who had been told that her unborn child, so the fetus in utero, had a birth defect, and she was told that she should have an abortion. Well, each of these two women carried the child to term, and lo and behold, when the child was born, it didn't have a birth defect. Okay? Case of Mother Teresa is even worse. I mean, a woman claimed, a Bengalese woman claimed that she was standing before a picture of Mother Teresa in her home and a beam of light emerged from the picture and this cured her of her cancerous tumor. Okay, her physician, one Dr. Rajan Mustafi, adamantly insists that first off, she didn't have a cancerous tumor in the first place. It was a tubercular cyst and they gave her a course of treatment that is standard for such cysts and she responded to the treatment exactly as should have been expected it was just simply a matter of having a malady, having it treated with conventional medicine, and it responded to the treatment. Her husband absolutely denies that it was a miracle. Absolutely. Yeah, this is deeply troubling. I mean, you it would is troubling. You would expect, especially in the case of a rushed canonization, that there would, there would be undeniably extraordinary... Rigorous extraordinary <clears throat> miracles. I mean, if, if, if it were the will of God that the Pope would short circuit the whole process, you, you would expect that there would be, I mean, just- He would demonstrate his divinity a lot more convincingly. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the miracle of Fatima, there were a hundred thousand people who saw it, right? And, and it was reported in the newspapers and there's never been any explanation of how it was, you know, how all these people were duped. I mean, let alone to have people actually who were close to the alleged miracle denying that it was a miracle. I mean, that, that's just, right, right, right. That, that's deeply troubling. Um, but there's another aspect to this, uh, one which I had never even imagined uh, until you, you brought my attention to it. And, and that's the, 
the problematic development of collegiality uh, as a part of this process. Uh, and, and one of the areas where this reduced rigor of the process um, that brings in a doubt these canonizations is the notion that, that collegiality and the nature of infallibility has, has changed. Has, has changed, right. Vatican II, and, and I found this very, very troubling. I, I, as, I, as, I was, as I was doing the research, I thought, okay, so this, this, this cre is very problematic with respect to canonizations, but, the, but it's much bigger than that. I mean, Vatican II defined a new kind of infallibility that, quote unquote, extends to the whole people of God with the concepts of collegiality and communion. John Paul explained that canonizations would be based on this new kind of infallibility. So canonizations would no longer be considered an act of the personal infallibility of the Pope's own personal solemn magisterium, but rather a matter of collegiality. So, so folks that are new to these conversations may, may not be certain what this word collegiality refers to. And, and, and kind of the broadest uh, concept, it's, it's the bishops of the world together and or uh, in union with the Holy Father, depending upon how the, the term is being used. And I had to look this up because I thought previously to our conversation, Jim, that really all this talk about collegiality had to do with the governance, governance, right? The, the role of the Pope governing the church versus the role, the rightful role of the bishops governing the church. Governing their di each individual diocese. And then we have this notion of Bishops conferences now having greater authority than individual bishops. That's that, right. It was, and, a, it was a question of governance. And, and this, this, this concept is, is growing, right? It's, it's like a contagion. Now we're having conversations about synodality and so forth. And so, but we're, we're talking about a much more narrow and, and I think less understood uh, problematic uh, interpretation of collegiality. And that is that that the bishops together have some sort of, of role, infallible role, uh, that, that plays a part in canonizations. And, and so right. you mentioned that JP2 had referenced Vatican II uh, as the source of this, this novel doctrine. Uh, he stated it in Divinus uh, per, uh, Perfectionis Magister, which was an apostolic constitution in 1983. And then again, in a motu proprio, Kind of the culmination of this uh, this teaching in Ad to Undum uh, Fidem in 1998. So if you're interested in the topic, you can kind of follow up on it there. Uh, and no question as well that um, uh, uh, Benedict completely ratified the idea. And, and of course, there's a problem with this too when we get back to Vatican I and we look at what what the fathers of that council taught about the nature of infallibility, what it's role was was to protect the deposit of faith to and to divine define not, it with not great, to invent stuff <laughs> yes uh, and and so here we have something which i think is completely novel in the history of the church as it regards Absolutely. the role of the the bishops a anyway so whatever infallibility that we can say was in previous eras assigned to canonizations was claimed to be the fruit of divine assistance granted only and specifically to the personal magisterium of the Pope. That, that, that's right. Mercifully, this new notion of infallibility, irony of ironies, <laughs> this new kind of infallibility has not been infallibly defined, nor will it ever be. I mean, it's, it's unprecedented. There's no precedent for a notion of infallibility and divine assistance that depends on anything other than the Pope's personal solemn magisterium. And in principle, we must reject all such novelties. In fact, this new notion of collegial infallibility has some troubling implications beyond canonizations, right? Because right, it, absolutely. It, it constitutes a second reason for us to have serious doubt about, these, uh, about the infallibility of some of these recent canonizations. Right. So first, first reason to doubt is the process has been dumbed down to the extent where it no longer does what it's intended to do. The second is this notion of an infallibility that depends on collegiality. And I said there were three, Jeff. Yeah, and, and the other one uh, is, is kind of a, a redefined heroic virtue. Our understanding of, of what really constitutes heroic virtue seems to have changed as well. Right. So 
the singular determination to be made in canonizations is the saint's practice of heroic virtue. <clears throat> Once that's established, then the person is raised to the altar and the public cultus is mandated. <laughs> the idea of heroic virtue, first off, the idea of virtue that hasn't changed. There's, there's no new virtues. But the idea of heroic virtue, that, that doesn't change with time. And yet, our yeah. understanding of it is supposed to change. If a person were supposedly, supposedly canonized according to this new understanding, <clears throat> how, how can we say that this is a legitimate canonization? If you've, if you've changed the criteria, does not that necessitate a change in the result? You would think uh, you change the change the inputs in a process. You should expect different different outcomes. I mean, John Paul himself said this is this isn't a matter of interpretation. John Paul himself said during a consistory on June thirteenth, nineteen eighty four, that the reason there were now so many more beatifications and canonizations was because the council has spotlighted quote spotlighted in a special way the universal call to holiness. In other words. The increase in number is due to a weakening in the criteria. I mean, how, how, that does not surprise. The holiness to which canonizations attest means something different now. It's no longer something rare. It's universal. Now, this, these words that the universal call to holiness, it, it's definitely a, a theme of Vatican II. Um, and it sounds okay on the surface, right? But it, it, oh, it sounds wonderful. It, but it does present two problems. I mean, nobody doubts that we're all called. Uh, you don't need the council to tell you that. It's, it's obvious in the Gospels. But the, the, it's not like the preconciliar church ever taught otherwise. It's not like this was, <laughs> the, the council needed to correct all these centuries of, of teaching of error, that, yeah. that we weren't all called. So the, the problem with this infatuation is it, it's of, of the universal call to holiness is it's it's not true i mean it's, it's objectively contrary to the facts we can look all around the world and <laughs> look around <laughs> i mean there, is there any place on earth where since the council there's the, been this explosion in sanctity in piety, in piety and saintliness piety where where it's not just comparable to preconciliar times in that place time and place but it's it's actually, you know, the, 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 the virtues are apparent and the fruits of all of these, the conversions you would expect to see, the vocations. Is there anywhere on earth where we could point and say, there the... <coughs> the I'm not seeing it, Jeff. I'm sorry. I mean, there, there is nowhere, right? There, there, I don't even think there's a single diocese in the entire world that is healthy when compared to the preconciliar times. Right. And... and and so we've had 60 years of, of obsession with the universal call to holiness, but it, there are no fruits of it. I mean, I, it begs the question, like, what about it, it approved apparitions like uh, Fatima or uh, is it Akita in Japan, where Our Lady is, is, is showing up talking about sin and so many people are going to hell and so forth. Is that what we would expect that God would send his mother to warn us? about the terrible consequences because it's all good <laughs> it, yeah i mean it I, I, they're just serious yeah, problems it's, it's, it's the, beyond belief the, the, the beatifications seem that the pace of canonizations the number of them all seem completely contrary to reality <laughs> in inversely exponentially and inversely correlated uh, it's it's crazy. All right. Well, I think you want to you want to you had a few comments about this whole. You know, so <laughs> this this same universal call to holiness, as expounded by the post Vatican II popes, also extends across different religions. I mean, it's just it's a pervasive theme in post Vatican II rhetoric. But not only even the very definition of what constitutes a martyr was unilaterally and arbitrarily changed by John Paul in the, in the case of Maximilian Kolbe. Maximilian Kolbe is unquestionably, he lived a life of heroic virtue. 
We don't need to make excuses for Maximilian Colby. Yeah, no, nobody doubts it. But but why why call him a martyr when he did not meet the criteria that had always been established by the church ever since apostolic times? I mean, it's it's like it's overboard. You're you're, you're they're, they're doing too much when it's not necessary. When the reality, the truth was was good enough. Now, the the definition of what constitutes a martyr has come to include a person who dies in defense of of human rights or some some social justice cause rather than strictly and only for the love of Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith. So it's kind of a, a it's like when we call um, secular heroes martyrs, right? He was a he was a martyr because he gave his life for the country or something. Right. But, right, but right Catholics right. have always had a different definition of what a martyr for the faith was. That that's the point, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, you know this one really. This one really frustrates me because I, I've lived in Latin America. <laughs> Let me guess. Oscar Romero. Yeah, tra I, I've traveled <laughs> widely there. I, I, I love the people. I love the culture. Um, and, and in many respects, they still have Catholic culture there, mm. uh, like used to exist in, in Catholic Europe. Um, and, and Oscar Romero, uh, for those who don't know, he was our archbishop in El Salvador uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, when there was a lot of turmoil in Latin America. Uh, the, the Soviet Union was trying to wage proxy wars in Latin America against the United States. They were, they were trying to get a foothold in, in Latin America, much like they had in Cuba successfully. Uh, and of course, the United States does that all around the world too, but uh, that's the way empires act. But what happened with uh, Archbishop Romero was he, was he was waging his own political war against the, the anti-communist against the, the forces that were backed by the United States. You know, the United States and Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, uh, all over the place, uh, Panama, Colombia, was financing and equipping these governments and, and guerrillas to fight against the communists. And, and it was vicious and it was ugly and it was terrible and lots of people died. Well, Romero was, you know, pushing back against those things. And, and, and it's never wrong to say that violence is awful and innocents die and so forth, but he was very, very political. So much so that he was, he was telling Catholics who are part of those anti-communist groups that, hey, under pain of sin, you've got to obey. You've got to drop your weapons. You've got to abandon these things and so forth. And they killed him for it. Now, he was saying mass when they shot him, but they didn't, they didn't assassinate him. It had nothing to do with why they shot him. It was, it was convenient. They knew where he was going to be. I was going to say because he, because he had his back to the people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean it, never mind. <laughs> I mean, it, I, we're laughing, not because it's, it's in any way. It's humorous. pathetic. It's because it's, it's, it's so sad, right? Um, maybe, maybe Romero is a saint in heaven, but, but he was not a martyr for the, the Catholic faith. No, absolutely he, was, he was shot by anti-communists who were angry that he was interfering. He was in denouncing their, them for their activity. Yes, and, and so to call him a martyr is, is, is we're, we're diluting what the, the word what, what martyr it means to die. So right. anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, it, it's, a <laughs> it's a rogation day, right? So I'm, I've, I've just got tea, I should have a martini or something to help me get through this conversation with you, Jen. But. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> so where does that leave us? Well, um, we, we can talk about John Paul's penchant for canonizing whomever <laughs> happened to be from the next place that this much traveled Pope happened to go. I mean, he, he actually said that he, he would canonize people at the next location he was going as a gift to those people. And so I could just imagine like the staff meeting where he sits down with his staff and he says, uh, guys, I'm thinking of going to uh, Hoboken, New Jersey, uh, and we need to canonize somebody there. So how about uh, who, who do we know from Hoboken, New Jersey that we can canonize on this trip? And somebody says, well, Frank Sinatra is from Hoboken, New Jersey. So we canonize him. Yeah, he, he did a great job on uh, Ave Maria. So, oh, yeah, right, right. <laughs>
So this, this is, you know, in politics, they call this uh, advanced planning and they have all these advanced teams that go wherever the president is going to be going and they're setting things up. It's not just security, but they are uh, they're, they're helping to, to facilitate, you know, all the, the local uh, political bosses and so forth. And of course, they want to find a pretty women with, you know, good looking children to show up and, and show that, you know, the president, you know, loves those things and so forth. Pressing the flash. Uh, right. Having apple pie and, and all the rest of it. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a smart the purpose of canonization. The <laughs> purpose of canonization is to hold up an individual's heroic virtue for emulation and veneration by the faithful, not to throw political bones to the people at your next destination. Yeah. And, and hopefully nobody is misunderstanding this. We're not saying that all of these far-flung places that JP2 went don't actually have saints in heaven from those places. We're not Absolutely saying that. Absolutely, they do. We're, we're not even saying that the people that that the hundreds and hundreds of people that he canonized uh, aren't saints. We're just saying that this 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 process has been like so many other things uh, since the council has been has been watered down, has been diluted, or it's been completely in a revolutionary spirit torn apart. And 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 the consequences, the, the fruits speak to to the prudence of that. Jim, we we now have a calendar that is is full of supposedly canonized but doubtful saints doubtful based on the process so so now what is, is there any precedent for possibly removing saints from the calendar in the future if, if we get to some point where there's a restoration of the glory of the church before our lord comes back is, is, is there any hope for correcting these things i i think there is i mean it's not unprecedented I, there are there are isolated instances. I mean, there was this one fellow from Lisieux, same place, St. Teresa, the so-called little flower, St. Teresa, the child of Jesus, um, Lisieux. He was, he was being honored there within the diocese as a martyr um, when actually he had died in a drunken brawl. <laughs> but, and, and so they were called out for that. But that, that was strictly a local matter. On the other hand, there have been cases where universally venerated saints were removed from the calendar. Benedict XIV, who was very instrumental in codifying the, the whole business of canonization, uh, and he reformed the process, um, removed several universally venerated saints for various reasons. Among them was, for example, Clement of Alexandria. And then, of course, there were various saints removed in 1969 with the advent of the Novus Ordo calendar saints, very dear to traditionalists such as Philomena and then beloved St. Christopher. Yeah, that's an extraordinary observation that that simultaneous to adding, you know, kind of the inflationary bloat of the of the choir of saints and so forth, we're we're subtracting saints. So, right. well, this, they have to meet the agenda, though. They have to. Yeah, we, we don't have a place for Philomena and Christopher anymore. Um, all right. So, does this raise questions of indefectibility if we assert that the church could actually put forward for veneration someone who is in hell? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a tough call. I hope not. I think in the end, it will have to be conceded that the process was inadequate and the results unreliable. And then I think the church is going to have to look at each of these and basically ask for a do-over. And I personally, and this is just opinion, I see all of these recent canonizations being reevaluated and some of them not making the cut. You know, I, I, I think we're likely to get a lot of, of pushback from people. And when they hear you talk about Mother Teresa or, or pick your saint that they've got a personal devotion to, and they'll say, well, how dare you? You know, she was obviously a saint. That's begging the question, of course. But, but the, this question of indefectibility, part of the, the crisis in our church is, a, is one of, of catechesis. And people don't understand that not everything the church does is guaranteed by our Lord to be perfect certainly not all infallible, but if, if we don't follow the processes that were designed to provide the, the, the outcomes that we could trust, then it's like the priest who doesn't follow the rubrics, he doesn't use the proper form and matter. It's exactly like that. It's exactly like that. At a, at a baptism, right? And, and people say, well, 
you know, God, God would never deprive, you know, someone of the fruits of baptism, you know, and, but, but if we yeah, don't, would, yeah, I mean, if, if obviously most of humanity has not ever been baptized, right? However, God's will is, is, is understood. Everybody before Christ was not baptized. And, and today, if priests don't use the right form, then that baptism is not valid. There's, there's a form for every sacrament and it needs to yeah. be, it needs to be, well, it's the, it's a very good point you make, Jeff. So, the, so the canonization can, business isn't isn't any different. It needs to ha, it needs to achieve what is what it's determined to achieve. And if it doesn't, then then you cannot have confidence in it. So, so, so canonizations are are not sacraments. They aren't part of the seven sacraments that that our Lord gave the apostles. But the process that's been developed uh, by the church is similar. To those from the standpoint that if we follow it rigorously we can we can have faith in it we could even claim like thomas and others that it, it would be it's infallible. Infallible. if we detract from that if we remove things if we remove the safeguards if we remove essential elements that point us to that destination then then that's where the worry comes and that and that's how as catholics we reconcile the promises god has given us about the indefectibility of church right. with what men can do to impede the, the work of the Holy Spirit. So, because I know a lot of people are confused today, it's a time of confusion, but, you know, take heart, this is where our Lord has placed us. He wants us to, to work through these challenges so that we can overcome them. And, and the beauty of that is greater clarity comes uh, uh, as a result in the lives of those of us that will survive this or or pass down to our children there will be greater clarity about all these things just like the council of trent was able to bring out of all of that evil of the protestant revolution greater clarity about the teaching of the church and the sacraments and, and so forth uh so so jim you said and we're left with three serious reasons to call the recent canonizations into question one the process has been relaxed to the point where it no longer fulfills its purpose uh, two canonizations now depend on a newly defined supposed infallibility that's based on collegiality. That's a mess. And then three canonizations are based on an entirely new understanding of what constitutes heroic virtue. Is that right? That's that. That's right. And that's. I, I mean, in a sense, that's that's scary business. But on the other hand, you know, it's. it's it's God's will. We're, we're, we are where we are because that's exactly where God wants us to be. So I'm good with it. Yeah. All right. So, um, folks, if you've been watching with us today, another a difficult, perhaps controversial conversation about an important topic, understanding the process that the church takes, uh, why she does that, what indefectibility means, uh, and what our role as Catholics is when, when it's time to submit our, our will and our intellect to the guidance of the church and when we are free or perhaps even obliged. O obliged. To obliged to question it. Because right now, the result is a process that makes possible canonizations that in the past would have been utterly unthinkable, unimaginable. A, a person whose reputation is controversial. What other saint in the annals of church history had a reputation that was controversial? Uh, or a person in whom the exercise of heroic virtue is is found terribly wanting. Yeah, so we we have to we have to question it. Jim, thank you as always for my pleasure. Being, God bless you with us today, folks. We've got some great topics coming up. Uh, in fact, topics that you have submitted to us uh, that we've put into the queue that we're going to be talking about to answer your questions about uh, what we Catholics believe and why and uh, what we do and why and how you can pass these things on to your, your family, your friends, your loved ones, and especially uh, if God has placed you in that role to your children to make sure that the faith is carried on during these times of crisis. Jim, thank you for being with us as always. Thank you, Jeff, and God bless you. Friends, we will see you next time. Bye-bye.